do. Um, what does that mean? Now, I'm not joking because I really stink at math. <laughs> I, uh, I took a test recently and um, I was quite embarrassed with the results of the test. The test was supposed to see whether or not I could go on to uh, graduate studies and uh, get a doctorate in Rome. And um, when I took the test, it was on math, and in that test, I got below average. And it was, it was uh, shocking. And then I realized I hadn't done math for about mm, 20 years. So <laughs> I guess it wasn't that shocking after all. So can anybody tell me what that means? What does that mean? Uh, allow same-sex marriage for the sake of equality. Allow same-sex marriage for the sake of equality. It's an equal sign. It's two lines. And uh, these two lines, they, uh, they're on a red background because red is, I don't know, shocking. And, um, okay, so that's my question. Now, if we notice, there's something interesting. If you just think about the symbol, what does the symbol mean? It's supposed to mean equals, but notice that you have two lines that are uh, going in the same direction. They're parallel to each other, and two parallel lines. Now, I know this much about math. Two parallel lines never meet, right? They just keep going on forever, out into the distance. So if we notice, there's a difference between uh, the two parallel lines and the plus sign, okay? So with the plus sign, what do you have? You have one line that is vertical, you have another line that's horizontal. When they meet up, they create a new shape. Plus, we've added something to the world. Parallel lines, they never meet. They're sort of individual, autonomous. You can replace one, and then you can place the other one, and you can't tell the difference. But you notice that with the plus sign, there is something different when they unite. This is going to tell us something about the difference between a relationship between people of the same sex and people of opposite sexes. When people of the opposite sex unite and they're fertile, you get something new. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so first, I think it's helpful to talk about what counts as gay. Sometimes people uh, talk about, you know, how do I know what gay is? And sometimes people are wondering, am I gay? And um, I'd just like to point out some things that aren't gay. So first, it's questioning. Is questioning gay? If, if you question yourself and your orientation, does that imply that you have a stable orientation? No, of course not. To question is to wonder about something. And of course, sometimes people, um, they wonder about who they are, sometimes they wonder about different things. When I was a kid, uh, one of the things my dad told my brother and I to uh, keep us busy when we'd go on these long car trips in um, going from California to North Dakota, my dad would say, you know, if you can kiss your elbow, you're, you'll turn into a girl. <laughs> Have you heard this before? Okay, I guess that's just my dad. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, so of course it was just my, yeah, exactly, that's, that's right, Pablo. That's exactly what my brother tried to do. He's, so for the next two hours, he's... Like, yes, do it, do it, do it! <laughs> the thing is, questioning is not the same thing as being, right? To ask a question, that's kind of up in the air. Well, I wonder, what, am I this or am I that? One of the most popular questions that people ask on the internet about uh, homosexuality is, am I one? Am I gay? That's interesting, isn't it? What it implies is that sometimes people, like, they're not sure. It's sort of um, like, I know that uh, I know I'm a man, okay, but I wonder, is there something inside of me? Is there something that I don't know about myself? Also, I would say that simply to be attracted to somebody else does not mean that a person is gay, okay? So for instance, um, sometimes people just, uh, you notice somebody who is of the same sex and you go, wow, that person's good looking. We can acknowledge this, right guys? And uh, it's, 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 it's this it's in itself does not mean that a person is gay. All it means sometimes is that they can recognize beauty. I remember, um, when, uh, when I was in high school, I was dating, you know, yeah, you know, we do that. And, um, I mean, not anymore, but, so, uh, yeah. so, the, uh, so there's my girlfriend, and, um, you know, I thought she was good looking, because, why, you know, anyway. So, um, anyway, but, uh, one thing I started to notice is that she would dress a certain way, and I would say, 
you know, uh, why are you dressing like that? I think you look great. You know, you don't have to put on all makeup and the hair and whatever. And she says, I'm not doing it for you. I'm like, some other guy? No, she's actually dressing for the other girls. Have you noticed this? That girls check each other out? Yes, yes. Not in a sexual way. They're just, they're watching what each other is wearing. They're kind of like, hmm, you know, they're paying attention. Oh, you got a haircut. And, oh, you know, look at that. So, okay. so simply to notice that, that somebody of the same sex is beautiful does not mean that you are gay. It could mean, as I said, simply that you recognize beauty. Now, we're going to go beyond that just a little step and to say, to be romantically attracted to somebody. Okay, that's obviously deeper than recognizing beauty. But to be romantically attracted to somebody who is of the same sex doesn't mean that a person is gay either. It simply means that perhaps there's an emotion there. Sometimes we can get confused about our emotions. You think, yeah, I, you know, I like this person, they're my friend. And then there is something that starts to happen and you start to wonder, oh, oh, well, that, that's a different feeling. It, it's no longer friendship. And you start to wonder, well, what does that mean about me? I, and people can get confused and they wonder what's happening interiorly. I would say, don't worry about it. Simply to start to feel a romantic feeling towards somebody toward whom you shouldn't have that feeling, it could mean that there's just something in your heart that needs to be guarded a little bit more. Because I'm going to suggest that uh, the term gay means something very specific in our culture. And it doesn't simply mean questioning or attraction. And also, it actually doesn't mean a same-sex sexual act. It's kind of a, not a great term. I was trying to figure out homosexual sexual act, homosex. I think that's the best term. So, um, it's, sorry, but I don't know what else to call it. Um, a same-sex sexual act does not mean that a person is gay. So, for instance, people can be experimenting. Where sometimes people, um, uh, you know, they're, they're in an intoxicated state, somebody isn't thinking about what they're doing, and now they perform a sexual act, varying degrees, uh, with somebody who's the same sex. Does that mean, oh no, I'm gay, I've done this one thing in my life, and now suddenly I can't go back. My, my identity is now confirmed, it's set in stone, it's never going to change. This is who I am. That's not the case. It's just simply not the case, because we know, similarly, if you perform, you know, one act, let's say you steal something, does that make you a thief? Well, no, of course not. You say, well, I, I stole something one time, I repented of, of it, I'm sorry. It doesn't mean that you're a thief, though. A thief is somebody who does this habitually, somebody who does this often. They're thinking about it, they get, you know, twitchy fingers, and then they go into uh, the market, you know, and they're kind of uh, trying to find that candy bar or something, if it's not let. <laughs> See, a, a thief during Lent won't steal a candy bar. They'll go for, you know, like an orange or something. <laughs> They'll wait till Easter. <laughs> okay, well, so the um, so same sexual act, just the act itself, does not mean that a person is gay. Understood in this modern concept. Um, same sex romantic feelings. Okay, so we talked about that also. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that the term gay is something that I approve of or that I think makes a lot of sense. Um, it's an ambiguous term. Sometimes it can include all of those depending on who you're talking with. So sometimes people say, well, um, uh, you know, what does the Catholic Church think about gays or homosexuals? And it's always helpful to distinguish. What are we talking about? People who are questioning, people who have an attraction, people who have done something, maybe one time or a few times, or people who have, you know, sort of stable feelings. Because sometimes people who have stable feelings toward the same sex, maybe there's somebody who always feels that way, a man who always feels that way towards men, or a woman who always feels that way towards women. Even then, they might not take that identity on themselves. They might say, you know, I kind of wish that I was more attracted to somebody of the opposite sex. Sometimes people who are in that situation, they say, I wonder why I feel this way. Why am I attracted to somebody who's of the same sex? And so then they try to explore that, and eventually they discover, well, I need, there, there's some healing that needs to happen. So here's what I'm going to suggest then. That um, gay is a label that people use in our time that indicates a couple of things. First, it indicates a lifestyle. A lifestyle of wearing wristbands. And, um, and it's a particular lifestyle. 
okay? And it's also an outlook. So we have the flag there, and it's a way of looking at the world. I accept this identity. And so now, whenever I look at the world, I identify people as gay or not gay. And sometimes people take that identity, and sometimes they don't. If they do take it, sometimes they look like that. Um, okay? And, um, and ultimately, it is related to a decision. So this is what the term indicates in modern culture. It's, it's lifestyle, outlook, activism, so they're trying to do something to promote it, and it's a decision. So I think that just getting that term down is helpful for us to see what this means in modern culture. Somebody perhaps who's not made the decision, who's not an activist, who doesn't have that outlook, who doesn't want to live that lifestyle, they would say, you know, I think that label doesn't fit. That box is too small for who I am. And that's perfectly all right. Now, what does the Bible say about um, homosexuality and same-sex attraction and so on? And um, this, is, this is a big question, right? So if we're Christians, sometimes this is going to be debated in uh, school, and people start to say things like, well, the Bible says this or the Bible says that. So I thought it would be helpful for me just to try to describe what does the Bible really say? And in order to um, recognize the importance of the Bible, I thought it was helpful just to point out a couple of things about the nature of the Bible. We can put it in three different ways. The Bible is God's word to us. He speaks it to us. Or we can put it this way. What the Bible says, God says. Or a third way to put it is to say, God speaks to us through the Bible. This is why it's important. It's not simply um, a helpful driver's manual. Now, um, how many people have actually pulled out you know, your, your little driver's manual that's in the glove compartment? The only time I've done this is um, when it was a, a really dangerous and foolish situation. So I'm driving along, and, and you know how we recently went through the time change, right? It was March 9th. So I'm driving in the car, and I notice that clock is wrong. And I keep driving, and I'm like, ah, that clock's wrong. <laughs> and then I start to think, I need to change the clock. And so while I'm driving, I reach over to the glove compartment. <laughs> Don't try this at home. And, uh, and I pull out the manual. I'm like trying to find you know the index that says change clock, and I'm like swerving around the cars, you know. And okay, so the Bible's not like that. It's not like a, a manual that we only pull out when um, we find it's you know convenient or necessary or dangerous. Um, instead, the Bible, as I said, is God speaking to us. So if we know what the Bible says about something, then it's God telling us something at the same time. It's God speaking to us right now. So first, the Old Testament. What does the Old Testament say about this sort of thing? Well, um, when I started looking up um, same-sex activity, uh, sexual activity, I started noticing that in the Old Testament, it was always contained in a context of other grave sins. So in Leviticus chapter 20, this is sort of the most famous part, before even getting to anything else, it starts to talk about what we are not to do. We are not to sacrifice children to the god Moloch. Basically, people would have babies, and they would burn them on the altar to this idol in order to get rain or in order to, well, have more money. Sound familiar to abortion? It also says that we're not to commit adultery. It says that people should not commit incest. It says that we should not commit bestiality, okay? Sexual activity with animals, not human animals. Um, and it says that the penalty for all of these is death. Wow. Sacrificing children to the god Moloch, adultery, incest, bestiality. The penalty for all of those, if you were an ancient Jew, is you would die. <laughs> Happy face. <laughs> okay, now what's the point here though? Okay, it goes on and it says included in that list is homosexual sexual activity. It's called an abomination. And um, I just want to talk about the historical context for a second. In ancient Israel, there were, of course, many other uh, peoples who did not believe in one God, they believed in many gods. And one of the things that they would do um, is they would perform you know, different activities that were related to those many gods. So people here, you've heard of Aphrodite. Yeah, okay, Aphrodite. Or she's called Venus. Um, so basically, there, there were female prostitutes of 
a goddess similar to Aphrodite. And they would have a temple set up. Men would come to this temple. They would give money to the temple. And then the prostitutes would you know, do their thing. And this paid for the livelihood of the female prostitutes. This was also the case, however, as time went on with male prostitutes. They would wear women's clothing. Women would come to the temple, or men, more typically men, and then so on. And so the Bible specifically, in talking about an abomination, it's speaking both about males with males and females with females in a sexual way. Very interesting. So this is uh, a more of an ancient problem than perhaps we realize. But notice that the whole point of all of this is about the breakdown of the family. Let's go back just for a second about those things that were considered grave sins. Sacrificing children, adultery, incest, bestiality. All of those are going against the family in some way, aren't they? It's undermining people's relationship, man and woman, together. And so this is exactly what's happening when you have males with males and females with females. It's the breakdown of the ancient family. Why is this a problem? Because God wants to promote that. Smiling babies. <laughs> I wish I could say that was me when I was a kid, but believe me, <laughs> we have no pictures of me like that. <laughs> now, what does the, um, what does the, what still applies? Okay, so not the practical application. We don't believe in the death penalty for any of those things. Incest, adultery, or whatnot. If you go to Israel right now, I was there, um, I didn't see, you know, any, there, there are no executions for any of these things. So the practical application no longer is uh, relevant. But the principle is. The principle applies. Why? Because these things are universal. They're for all time. That family that the God is trying to protect, that's always present in human nature. And so this is what God is trying to show us. So if we say it didn't apply, then we'd have to say, we'd have to dismiss when the Bible in the Old Testament condemns theft, lying, hating, revenge, adultery, incest, bestiality, idolatry, and so on. Right? So it still applies, although the practical principle doesn't. Yeah. New Testament. Now, here's, here's something. When I was talking with Brad about this, one of the things he uh, mentioned, he says, Father, one of the things I'd really like you to address is uh, Jesus. The whole issue about what does Jesus say on this issue? Because a lot of people think that Christ never spoke about homosexuality. How many people have heard that argument before? Jesus hasn't spoken about homosexuality, and so, you know, since he's silent, therefore, you know, A-OK. -okay. <laughs> that's kind of what people think, right? You know, like, you know, you're good, I'm good, you know. That's great. This is my image of Christ. <laughs> this is how I see him. Because there he is. He's rational. He's blessing. And he has a book in his hand. Christ doesn't contradict the Old Testament. He fulfills it. So, Jesus does speak about same-sex activity. Yay! <laughs> okay, what does he say? Well, he talks about friendship. Think about this for a second. Friendship is a same-sex activity, right? Me and my bros, me and my buds. Okay, this is, it's a same-sex activity. It's not romantic, and it's not sexual, but it's the same sex. Christ says something about this kind of same-sex activity. What does he say? You are my friends if you do what I command you. Isn't that interesting? This is how he thinks about friendship. Oh, <laughs> it's in the Bible. <laughs> okay. Now what does Jesus command us to do? Well, he says, do not sin. Sin no more. And here's what he calls a sin. He says, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These, he says, are what defile a man. Notice anything interesting about this list? It's very similar to what we saw in the Old Testament, right? It's actually almost exactly the same. And if we want to know if Christ is speaking about same-sex sexual activity in this case, well, we just have to look at a couple of definitions. Okay, he says sin no more. What did Jesus say? Oops, I'm going the wrong direction. There we go. Oh, technology. Okay, there we go. Okay, there we go. So first, he's adultery. When he condemns adultery, he says it's sex with a non-spouse. So somebody who's married is having sex with somebody who's not married. Obviously, not their spouse. Clear enough. 
he talks about fornication. That's sex between unmarried people. Now, if, um, it's not that exciting, believe me. <laughs> now, the, um, so what we try to figure out is, does, um, does same sex, does homosex fit into adultery or fornication? Well, the last definition we need is marriage between one man and one woman. Jesus tells us that in Mark chapter 12. So, all sexual activity between members of the same sex are either going to be fornication, unmarried, or it's going to be somebody's committing adultery. Okay, so it's very clear. This is excluded by what Christ says. What does Jesus call sin? There are the seven deadly sins, and there's the one that applies. Really, it's all of the above. <laughs> okay, does that make sense? Okay, so, so he doesn't use the word homosexual. He doesn't use the precise word that we're thinking about, but he does talk about the concept. And he's showing us that this is still contrary to what? To the good of the family. Okay? So ultimately, we can say, yes, Christ does talk about this because he talks about the good of the family. One man, one woman, one baby, we hope. Maybe once. Yay. Okay, now let's go to the to the New Testament context. These guys are more than friends. Um, this is uh, now in Israel in Jesus's day, uh, same sex uh, sexual activity was still outlawed. In within Israel, where Jesus lived and breathed and walked around, if you were caught you know performing those activities, you would be killed. So Christ, one reason why Christ never spoke about it is because it never happened where he lived. But if you go to where St. Paul lived, and he was a Roman citizen, he's living in some of the pagan towns, he visited the pagan cities of Greece, and eventually made his way to Rome, this is what was going on. Actually, I found pictures that I couldn't show you. So, um, so this, this is the New Testament context for what, what happened. Ancient pagan homosexuality it wouldn't have been ancient Jewish, because then basically it didn't exist, um, as far as you know, we know. Some were for it, some were against it. Plato talks about this. We know about Plato, Plato and Aristotle, okay? Not the Silly moldable, guy. edible <laughs> uh, material. No, I'm, we're talking about uh, Plato. Um, and uh, Plato, he actually describes how in ancient Greece, some people were quite in favor of this. And he, he condemns it because he says, what would happen in ancient Greece, about, got adopted by Rome, is that older males would take younger males, and they would try to induct them into the military, or they would try to promote them in some way. They'd become their mentors, but at the same time, they would use their bodies. Okay? What would we call that? Pedophilia. So this is the ancient context for a lot of homosexual activity. Okay, now you know the Emperor Nero. That's, that's one of the Christians being eaten by, looks like a I don't know, a giant mouse, and uh, <laughs> so this is what Nero would do. Uh, I think he's most famous for um, you know, killing the Christians, and, uh, and we know from ancient documents that uh, Nero actually took some of the Christians and he bound them to stakes and he burnt them alive in order to provide uh, lighting for his night parties. So that, that's what he's most famous for, but something that uh, people don't know is before he had all these uh, parties with the Christians and um, where you know, he got his animals involved, um, his petting zoo went wrong. Um, before that, Nero actually uh, went and had a same-sex marriage. Nero is depicted on the uh, right there, and he, he dressed up like a woman. And uh, the person on the left is uh, a philosopher that he wanted to marry. And um, Nero actually did this a number of times. He married both women and men. Since he's the emperor, he could legalize anything. You know, can't stop me. And, um, and so this is something that happened. And many of the Romans in his day recorded this in their history books. Some of the stuff, uh, I can't repeat, it's that explicit. So what, what's interesting, however, is that Nero was in this state when St. Paul tried to preach the gospel to him. Paul actually got to Rome, and he got to 
um, speak to the Roman emperor because there's a special clause that if, if people condemned you to death, which they were trying to do to St. Paul, you could appeal to the emperor so you could talk to him face to face. Well, we know that St. Paul eventually did talk to the Roman emperor and um, things didn't turn out quite like we might have hoped. What does St. Paul say? Well, he says, do you not know that the unjust will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now he gives us a list of things. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor boy prostitutes, we talked about that, nor practicing homosexuals. I don't know if he said this to Nero's face, but it was definitely on <laughs> St. Paul's mind. Okay? He says in another place in Romans, he says, God gave them over to their shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lusts for one another. Men committed shameful acts with each other and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Wow. Was he talking about Nero? He's talking about the culture, the pagan culture that he saw face to face. And he recognized that this was contrary to the good of the family, contrary to the human good. Here's Nero's response. I don't know if you can see St. Paul's head is kind of like tumbling down the hill there. <laughs> um, so St. Paul was beheaded. This is why St. Paul is always depicted with a sword in his hand. Not because he's going to kill us, but that's because that's how he was killed. So the ancient Christians, just like the ancient Jews, always push up against the culture of their day, which tried to undermine the family. And sometimes the culture of the ancient Jews, well, it prevailed for a time, and then it receded back. And for the Christians, it seemed like this is not a winning strategy. We might say to St. Paul, really, is this the best way to go? Shouldn't you just you know, try to compromise a little bit on your faith? And do you really want to go that far? He risked his neck for it. Now, one thing that people start to say is, um, like, you know, one answer to this is, we're not supposed to judge. Judge not, right? We're not supposed to judge people. So if I'm judging, if I'm saying that thing is wrong, aren't I going against what Jesus tells us? So here I just want to tell you a little story about a Dominican sister's grandma. Uh, this has told me very recently. So one of the uh, sisters here, she told me how just last week um, she got a phone call. I was actually there right after she got the phone call. And um, basically what happened was there was a, a person who was high on drugs. He breaks into her grandma's house, and her grandma was there. She runs to her room. She locks the door. Well, this crazy you know, drug addled guy is looking for money. He finds the knives instead. And he starts running around the house, tipping things over, and he's, you know, and then he realizes the grandma's in the room. He starts pounding on the door. He busts, he busts the door open, and he walks through, and he has knives in his hands. And the grandma, she's worried. She pulls out the phone next to her bed. She dials 911. But while she did that, she fell on her face, literally breaking three or four bones in her face. She got on the phone, 911. She says, there's a crazy drug out of guy. He's trying to kill me. And the operator says... Who are you to judge? Just joking. That's not what the operator said. <laughs> but that's wrong, right? Wouldn't that be the wrong response? No, the operator should say, we're going to send a cop, we're going to get that guy, you know, uh, try to strangle him with a phone cord. <laughs> okay? So sometimes we have to say, no, we do need to judge. This guy's crazy. He's coming after me. Okay? So sometimes judgment is reasonable. We shouldn't judge a person's salvation. I don't know what's going on in that drug addict guy's life. Maybe he had a bad childhood. Maybe, who knows? Okay, I don't want to judge that. That's what I'm not judging, is why he's doing it, or uh, if he's going to go to heaven. I don't know. That's up to God. What I do know is that, you know, charging an old woman with a knife looking for drug money is bad. So what can we judge? Well, we can judge a person's external actions and say, that's wrong. That's disordered. This is contrary to the family. This is going to hurt people. This is going to hurt you. And sometimes we can even judge a person's intention. Not always. But when somebody says, I want the family to be destroyed, and I think that we need to change the definition of marriage, you say, that's not a good thing. So ultimately, then, our Lord is telling us that we should never judge a person's intentions. And when, oops, 
No, we're not going to go there. We don't have much time. So, so when Pope Francis says, who am I to judge? The context of his statement was he, he said, if someone is living a chaste life and trying to serve the Lord, who am I to judge? In other words, how can I judge their salvation? They're trying to do the right thing. And that ultimately is what we are called to do, is not to judge people's salvation, but to try to bring them closer and closer to Christ through our love and our charity. And there I think we're going to have to uh, call it quits, right? Do we have time for questions or no? Yeah, five minutes. Okay, five minutes for questions. So I've given you a lot. We've talked about the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, judging, Nero, um, my bad math skills. So feel free to ask me anything unmath related. <laughs> yeah. What happened to the grandma? Well, um, what happened was the uh, so after she fell on her face, luckily she was not too far from a police station. They actually um, the police arrived at her house. The the drug fellow ran away, dropping all the knives, and um, they caught him. So she's having to go through facial reconstructive surgery though. The sister said her face looks like one giant bruise. Yeah. Okay. Another. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So in, in the Old Testament, um, I know that I, I I never exactly know when to say that like the death penalty no longer applies. Why did it change exactly? How did that change come about? Okay. Yeah. So the question was about the the death penalty. Why did that change? How did that come about? Basically, because in the Old Testament, the moral laws and the civil laws were united. And so when God said um, these things are an abomination and then there has to be the death penalty, the death penalty is the civil law aspect. Obviously, we no longer live in the country of Israel. And in time, the, the country of Israel began to realize, well, that civil law is really harsh. There are a lot of reasons why it's not a good idea. And so now they're, they're changing the way that moral principle is applied. Um, and so with Christians, we don't apply any of the civil laws of the Jewish people. Because we're not Jewish, we don't have a Jewish state. That's part of the advantage of being a Gentile. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Plus we can eat uh, burgers with cheese. <laughs> don't have to eat kosher. Yeah. Um, what a lot of people have said to me about Leviticus is that there's a lot of like really like weird and like specific laws in there. And that we're just like picking and choosing which ones we want to keep. How do you want to... How do you respond to that? Okay, so the question, um, it seems like there are lots of weird uh, laws in Leviticus, and it seems like we're picking and choosing which ones to keep. Well, the ones that um, we know are universally valid are the ones that also were repeated in the New Testament. So the ones that I mentioned uh, in Leviticus are actually the ones also mentioned by Christ and by St. Paul. So that's one indication. And that tells us, oh, this is a moral principle. It always applies to all people all times. You know what else is in Leviticus? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's, that's where we got it from. When Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, he was just quoting the book of Leviticus. So we know that's always universal. Yeah. Another? Oh, just playing with hair. Okay. No, don't look that direction. <laughs> okay, another? Uh... Yeah. Have I had an argument with a homosexual about homosexuality? Um, I would say uh, I've had discussions. I, I don't think they ever escalated to argument, um, and certainly never to you know fist fight level or <laughs> anything like that. Luckily, it wasn't like a, a math duel because I would definitely have lost. But um, no, but I, I've certainly discussed you know the issue with some people, and some people uh, it, it just depends. It's it's a whole variety of positions, and that's another thing to recognize is. It's not as if everybody is all a single label. You know, that, that label we were talking about, gay or homosexual, is such a small box. And to recognize each person is unique and individual, and each person may look at the issue slightly differently. And so we don't even want to say, oh, well, they're, you know, everybody's all the same or something like that, and even in discussing the issue. Like what we believe to someone who is not 
how do we explain what we believe to somebody who's not Christian? Okay, yeah. Well, um, I think that the, the fundamental thing is the family. That's, that's the fundamental issue. And as I said at the beginning, we talked about the two parallel lines. You can't produce a child from that relationship. That, that is something that in the end is, is about mutual emotions or pleasure. But the, the man-woman relationship is always related to children ultimately. And so anytime that we want to take the child out of the relationship between a man and a woman, it's going to be bad for the child. So I think that that's something that is, that's at least a fruitful discussion. It's always interesting to see where that goes when you talk about the family and say, okay, well, where, you know, where does that go? Because what we would say is the romantic relationship is tending toward union of body and union of soul. And the proper union of body and soul is in the self-gift that happens in marriage. Yeah. What would you say to people who just say love is love? Love is love. That's a big argument for that. Wow. I, I didn't <laughs> it doesn't sound like an argument. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, what I would say is, actually, there are lots of different kinds of love. We know that. I love strawberries. I love, uh, you know, I love uh, bread. I love my mom. And um, I love to get down. You know, so <laughs> these are all different kinds of love. <laughs> and so it's always helpful to say to somebody, do you mean friendship? Do you mean romance? And then they'll go, well, I mean everything. And then you say, well, actually, no, because the way I love my dog is not the way I love a person. And it's not the way I love somebody I'm in love with. So that's, that's where I think it's a helpful to kind of you know, explore that. Yeah. You know, go down that trail and start to talk about, well, okay, what do you mean? You know, what are the fruits of that? Uh, what do you say to people who say, like, I'm made that way, or I've always been made that way? Okay, yeah, great question. Um, when I gave the talk a couple of years ago on this issue, basically what we'd say is, uh, the way people feel oriented towards somebody, you know, romantically, that is the product of many different causes. Partly it's genetics, partly it's actually what we call brain wiring, the way chemicals work. Partly it is their, their cultural context, what you grew up with. A lot of people who identify as being attracted to the same sex, that something happened to them when they were children. So all, all I would say is if somebody you know, says, well, I made that way, are you saying that I'm bad? I would just say, no, God made you good. But what we need to do is try to explore um, how you can try to order what you are. Father Ezra was made a certain way, I'm bad at math, but maybe you know, through lots of effort, I can get better at it. So we want to order our desires properly. It's not as if every single desire that we have is one, natural, and two, something that we can, uh, that's unchangeable. Is it true that the rise of homosexuality also shows sort of the end of a nation's lifespan? Uh, okay, so the question here is, uh, does the rise of homosexuality indicate uh, the end of a nation's lifespan? That's a complicated question, and um, the basic answer is we're not exactly sure. Those things seem to be correlated, but it's not exactly. Civilization's end for all sorts of reasons. And we would say this perhaps is one indication just of, in general, when, the, when there's no more family, there can be no more people. For, okay, here's just a little statistic. I'm sorry, Brad, I know we're going long. But okay, Japan. Uh, economists tell us that within, within by 2050, 50, 50 zero, there will be almost no Japanese people, pure Japanese people. Do you know why? They're not having children. The, the birth rate of Japan is in the negative, okay? So you need a certain number of people to replace you, you know, in order to have a civilization. Every, every man and woman has to have 2.1 children. Well, in Japan, it's like 0 .0 or 0.15 or something. It's, it's really, really small. So what this means is that within a generation, there are fewer Japanese people to have children, and in a generation after that, there are even fewer Japanese people. Now they can start to marry non-Japanese people, but that means that, as I said, fewer Japanese, there are going to be fewer and fewer. So by 2050, there's almost going to be none. And it's at the point where it's irreversible. Isn't that interesting? 
This is one of the reasons why Japanese are making so many robots to replace themselves. <laughs> <laughs> this is a whole theory of mine. <laughs> so, so what this tells us is that you have to have a family, you have to have a man and a woman having children to have a civilization at all. The more you have uh, non-families, people can do, coming together in a sexual relationship without children, the less that civilization is going to survive. That's what we know. Um, so with regard to all the, uh, the cases that have been happening lately with like people refusing to serve a couple, a gay couple for a wedding or whatever, mm -hmm. how do you explain to somebody that that's not discrimination but a religious reason? Okay, all right. Um, so, uh, so people uh, not serving, see, so there was a photographer in Arizona She's a wedding photographer, she was a Christian, and um, to uh, a homosexual couple, they, they wanted her to photograph their union, and they called it marriage, and she says, no, I, I don't feel comfortable with that. I believe marriage is a man and a woman. She got sued, and uh, she lost the suit, okay? And so the question is, or there are other cases too, you know, there's like a bed and breakfast, I think, in Massachusetts, a similar case. So the question is, well, how do we, how do we explain this? Because it sounds like we're being discriminatory, I would say, we are being discriminatory. We are. We're discriminating between real marriage and not real marriage. We're saying that, that what is not real marriage is dangerous to society. Real marriage is good for society. Okay? So, um, and, and we could say it's partly for a religious reason, but partly it's not. Family is something that exists outside of religion. So I'm going to suggest, actually, that there's always some kind of discrimination in the sense that people will make a distinction. This is good. This is bad. We, don't, we like this. We do not like that. We think that this is appropriate. This is inappropriate. This happens all the time. So for instance, um, if you go to an abortion clinic, they don't let you go inside the, the abortion clinic if you're pro-life. They discriminate against you, don't they? Why? Because they don't want you to harm their business. People are always discriminating. This is the nature of the thing. Uh, if there's a gay pride parade, they don't want they don't want the people who are in the parade. They don't want you to be on the sidelines proclaiming the goodness of the family. They don't want you know pro family float, mom, dad, and the kids, you know, all playing their banjos, um, or okay, a violin, a flute, a singer, and a drum set, you know. Okay, so whatever it is, they don't want you there. Um, why? Well, because ultimately. They're against that. This is something that's contrary to what they think is good. So there's going to be discrimination on both sides. So I say, embrace the discrimination. Let's have a real discussion. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Last question. arguments actually um, in, in talking with people about whether or not um, the state should redefine marriage as uh, between one man and one woman is to say that most um, actually most uh, homosexuals you know, they've done lots of studies on this most of them actually don't want stable long-lasting marriage that's the view that we get in the media but study after study shows that what they actually want is um, is to undermine this kind of relationship at all. Like what we're imagining is, well, you know, there's a man and there's a woman, they've been married for 50 years, and now there's a man and there's a man, they want to be married for 50 years also. But the best argument is to say, actually, you know what? Uh, most people who are, who are active, who identify themselves as gay, they actually have up to four partners a year, even though they call themselves uh, within, within <laughs> a stable, loving relationship. We're like, wait a second, that would never work in what we would call marriage between a man and a woman. You know, the man finds out that the woman has you know, done this, and he's, no way, no. In fact, I was just preparing somebody for marriage, and he says, if and any lady looks at the woman, he says, if you ever cheat on me, it is over. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, they're not even started yet. You know, this <laughs> it's a completely different thing. What, what it means to be stable in a relationship between a man and a woman. Why? Because a man cheats on a woman with another woman, he could get the other woman pregnant, and now he has children from her. If a man cheats on another man, what are the consequences? They're emotional. They're not biological. 
Isn't that interesting? So the whole notion of faithfulness in a homosexual relationship is completely different, and they will admit that. So I think that's that's an interesting argument to uh, say, is to say, somebody says, well, um, why aren't you in favor, in favor of gay marriage? I'd say, actually, most gays aren't in favor of gay marriage. And, and then that starts an interesting conversation about faithfulness and what does love mean. So, so what I'd like to do is, you know, to <laughs> take the bull by the horns. Yeah, why not? 